size 11 H. We're going to move into miscellaneous is what the exercise is, 11 H. And uh, really, after 11 H, you only got three more exercises. You got I, J, and K. Fundamental theory of calculus, you have areas between graphs, and uh, what was the last one on this? Area between graphs. Oh, that seems like the main one. Oh, and average value function. Those are the three that you need to know. Um, they're all easy to pick up. What you needed was everything beforehand, which hopefully you did your holiday homework, or at least just practice and revise integration. Um, for those for exercise or chapter seven, if you were to just go ahead, if you've done chapter 11 already, 7b and c are probably the only two that's most important. It's so compass and inverse functions. And uh, I think it was um, a with power functions. What was the c? I forgot what c was. Another name for it. I can't remember. It was, no, that's it. I just know 7b and c were the important ones. Okay, here we go. 11H, we're going to revise just some of the skills that you've learnt so far. So, let's remember, let's recap. What was 11A about again? Can I please have, let's go with Jack. Do you remember what 11A was about? So, the very first part of the integration, what we learned. Uh, no, that was B. Before, so we wanted to know what integration was. Oh, uh, Blocks, area under the curve, which we use what? Right, left and right end rectangles. Okay, so this is your left and right and rectangles, and they are just simply the symbol integration means sum of your function, which is your length multiplied to the change in your width. That's what integration was. Okay, so that was integration. Then 11b, which is what Jack said, it was indefinite integrals. Indefinite integrals, which is what? What did I do in 11b? So after I taught you, okay, we've got rectangles to find area under the curve, then I taught you something else. We linked something, these two things together. Naz, what was 11b? Indefinite integrals. The very first rule that you learnt. Power rule, good. So, what we learnt was, power rule is the derivative. The derivative using the power rule, so that means we can go the inverse, which we call the antiderivative. So 11b, you, you linked, antiderivative is the same as the integration, which is the area under the curve. That's why you said, oh, that means if I can do the inverse of the power rule, I can do the integration, which is the area under the curve, of any power rule. That was the beginning. Okay, so that was the beginning. We now know antiderivative equals area under the curve. Okay, I haven't told you why, I just told you how. Okay, so we now know Integration of any power function, so instead of f of x just being any function, we're saying what if the function was a power function, so x is power something, power 2, x is power 3, x is power half, okay, you've got to rule for that. And that rule came from doing the inverse of a power rule. Okay, so what was the rule again, Jerry? If I want to integrate ax to the power of n, what was the rule again? Um, Good, n plus 1, good, and? Good, that's why they're called indefinite integrals, okay? Because when you find the derivative, the constant will always be 0, so when you find the antiderivative, you don't know what a constant is. That's why it's plus c, so that's indefinite. After indefinite, so we learnt, okay, indefinite is just finding the antiderivative, because that gives us the integration. So what was 11c about then? If I taught you indefinite, then the next thing has to be, what's the next one? Sharon? Definite. Okay, you got indefinite integrals, then you got definite integrals. What is definite integrals, Zahn? What's the difference? If you have indefinite and definite, how do you know the difference between two? Good, excellent. It's bounded by an interval. Okay, so definite is only when you have an interval. And the way I explained it was kind of like your derivative. If you found the derivative x squared, it gives you a gradient function, but it doesn't tell you the gradient. How do you find the gradient? It gives you a point. Same thing with the area. If you find the 
indefinite interval just gives you an area function. It doesn't give you the area until you give a certain point. You say like from A to B, that's when you get an area. Okay, so this is an area function. Definite will give you an actual area. But the only way to get that is if you got an interval between A to B and you still integrate or find the antiderivative of f of x dx. Okay? And this is where your fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. I haven't shown you the proof, but I taught you the rule. Okay, what was the rule again? So you got from A to B, what was the rule? Yes, Luke. Um, Very good. Capital F just represents the antiderivative. So whatever this function is, if I can find the antiderivative, that, that is the function. B just means sub the upper interval in, subtract sub A into the new function. Okay, this here will give you the area. Okay, that, that's what we were doing. So 11B, 11C, indefinite is the skill. This will evaluate. That's what you were doing. Okay, so that's 11B, 11C. Now after you learn indefinite, you learn definite. What do you think we're going to be learning in D, E, and F? All of those were doing what? What were we doing? What was D? No, the weird one was, well actually the weird one was C, but uh, I got the, the letters wrong because I thought it in a, in a jumping. So, no, that was E actually. Sorry, my bad. This is actually E. Let's go back to 11C. C was the weird one. What's the weird one? What were the rules for the weird one? I mentioned about this being in every single exam, and I showed you from 2009 to 2016, it has the same two rules that you need to know. Now, good. We have integration of, now this is a chain rule, the inverse of a chain rule, where you have AX plus B to the power of R. Okay, normally when you do the chain rule, you have to derive the inside, the minus power by one. It's the same thing when you're doing the reverse. The rule, if r is not what? Negative. Not negative one. If it's not negative one, then the rule will give you one over a r plus one times a x plus b to the power of r plus one. I'll see. Okay, that's the rule if r does not equal to negative one. So that's one part of it. That's a power function there. That's technically just the power rule. Okay, this is when r does not equal to negative one. But when r does equal to one, then ax plus b to the power of r dx is equal to what? For the negative one. Thank you. Whoops. Okay, so it's equal to negative one. And what is the rule again? Can I please have, let's go to Phoenix. What's the rule? Yep. Good. Fantastic. Okay. So these are your two rules in the C and the one that's not in your exam or your formula sheet is this one. Because in the exam, what they give you is integration of 1 over x dx is log e of x. Because we know the derivative log is 1 over x. That's why in your formula sheet they're right, okay, well the antiderivative of 1 over x is log e of x. And this is the rule that doesn't come in and that's why they put it in the exam. Because most students forget that 1 over x is the same thing as x to the power of negative 1. That's why they say when r is negative 1, you will be using that rule. Yes, Luke, why do you write that equation with the r when this only can be negative 1? Yeah, I think it's just because it, they both look pretty much the same. Uh, it's just that r could be any value. They just thought to keep those two similar, they have r equals negative 1. But really, you don't need to. You need to know that they're two different functions. They're totally different, actually. Uh, one's log and one's not. Um, but that's that's why I'm saying that this is worthwhile remembering and doing from 11C, because they will put it in. It's a fraction. Students hate it. They'll put a negative in. The students will miss out on that. And when you're doing that and doing definite integrals, you're likely to make a mistake somewhere. Okay? So these two all in nicely. So that was 11C. What was 11D? So we learnt how to find the antiderivative of power functions, we learned how to do the antiderivative of log functions, we learned how to do the antiderivative of uh, chain rule of power functions, what are we missing? That's where your D and F and G comes in. What was D? 
What are we missing? Everything that you know about derivatives, you would know in antiderivative. What are we missing? Exponentials. Okay, so we had log, we need exponentials, and that's 11D. So in 11D, you learnt how to find the antiderivative of an exponential equation. Okay, so find the antiderivative of if a function was e to the kx. Okay, so really you're just trying to find the area or the integration, which is the area of the curve of e to the kx. What was the rule again? Can I please have Aiden? That is correct. 1 and k. Yep. That's it. Because we know the derivative of exponential is itself, so the, deri uh, the antiderivative has to be itself as well. The only difference is when you find the derivative, you bring the k down and it goes times. So now, instead of timesing, you're dividing. Dividing the k. Okay, you're just doing the inverse, what we normally do. Instead of like power rule, normally you say times by n, you know, you're dividing by n. Okay, that's, that's the only reason why it's called inverse. So now you know exponential, you know log, you know, uh, what, what do we do? Or is it D? We do log, exponential, power rule, and chain rule. What are we missing now? So that was D, E was the definite integral. What was F? We'll do an F. G was sine and cosine. F was a bit of a sneaky one. F follows from definite. So definite tells you area, the actual area under the curve. But there's something about area under the curve that you had to worry about as well, which is F. What's the other thing, Jack? Let's sign area. Okay, so you can have area above the x-axis, and you can have area below the x-axis. Even though it might be the same value, so the example I gave to you was like a straight line equation. The area from, let's say, negative 1 to 1 is a triangle. This triangle is the same as this triangle, but the direction is different. And when you're doing mathematics, the direction does matter whether you have negative y values or positive y values. And because of that, this technically would tell me there's two of the same area. But if you're looking in direction, technically I haven't moved anywhere. Okay? Because this is like saying left one and then right one. So if you think about it, this is the origin, left one, right one, and I'm back to the same spot because there's a direction. But in terms of steps, I've taken two steps, one and two. And that's the same thing with this here. Then we're saying we've got one area, plus another area, it should be two areas. Okay, so uh, exercise F was about you look, working with negative area, which means when it's below the x-axis. Now, when the question asks you to find the exact area, it means they don't want to find the net sign, they don't want to know the overall signed area, they want to know the exact area. How do you counteract negative areas? What do you have to know from that exercise? There's only one thing you have to do to counteract that negative area. What do you do? The modulus or perfect yeah there's two ways to do that so you're right you have so let's say I'm just going to draw a little picture here if you have this whoops uh, let's go with here there we go from 0 to 1 let's say the area is negative you can say and the function let's call it f of x okay so I don't we want to find the area under the curve. Now, you know if you find the integration of f of x dx, which is find the area between 0 and 1, we know the area is going to be negative. Okay, we know the area is going to be negative. Now, there's two ways to make it positive. Because when you have a positive, then you can add them all together. If you have negative, that's a problem. 2 minus 2, for example, makes 0. You want 2 plus 2 to make it 4. To count, right? The only way to do that is either you put a negative, which is what Ed Sarah said, you put a negative in front of it, so you have to know that this is below the x-axis, put a negative in the outside to counteract the fact that this is a negative area. Alternatively, you do what Luke said, put a mod over it. Okay, if you mod this, whatever this area is, you mod it, and it just means that if this is negative, make it positive. Okay, so you can mod it, and you calculate it, or you can just do it by hand as well. Alternatively, number three, using your properties from exercise E, 11E, that's where your properties were, you can also reverse the interval. Okay, so on your, on your calculator, or what you, you don't have to do it on your calculator, but if you did the intervals from, because normally it's lower bound to upper bound, if you changed it from 1 to 0, you'll find that it'll end up being negative anyway. You counteract. Okay, because if you had a larger number minus a smaller number, it's positive. But if you switched it around, it becomes negative. And the two negatives will now. 
Okay, so that's another way of doing it. You can switch the intervals, put a negative or mod. Three ways to do it. Okay, but that's exercise 11F. Now 11G, just finishing off. 11G, what are we missing now? So we've done exponential, log, power rule, chain rule. What are we missing? Sine, okay, sine. So if you know the derivatives, you know the antiderivatives for it. So if I give you now 11g, here we go, 11g, antiderivative of sine of x. So you've got to question yourself now, derivative of what will give you sine of x? Derivative of what? Cos x. Okay, but we know the derivative cos will give you negative sine. Okay, so that means when you're doing the antiderivative of sine, it has to now be negative cos. Okay, now, because normally you have, oh, wait, I'll just do it over here. Normally, derivative, uh, antiderivative sine of, we normally have a kx there. Then the answer would be, instead of times it by k, because that's a derivative, the antiderivative would be 1 on k, because you're dividing by k. Okay, instead of times by k, you're dividing by k, and it'll be a negative cos of kx plus c. Okay, that was one of the rules for 11G, and then you do antiderivative of cos of kx. Now you ask yourself, well, derivative what? It would be cos x, and we know that has to be sine. Okay, and the same rule, same idea, it's instead of times in by k, we're dividing by k, we're doing the inverse. So times by sine of kx plus c. Now it's 11G. How's that recap? Pretty good, but you can see how they've linked. Every exercise links to a skill while you were learning it. But really, E and F was the only one that was together, so it was about area, which is the antiderivative. But before all that, see, B, C, F, and G are all just inverses of your derivative. If you know derivative of sine, you've got antiderivative. You know anti I mean derivative of cos, you got the antiderivative. That's 11D. You know the derivative of exponential, that's 11D. Wait, is that D? Yeah, so D. Okay? Same thing with log, that's C. Power rule, that's B. Okay, so that's that's what I mean. They're all just the derivatives in the reverse. And you had to understand just A was rectangles, which is integration. And you've got your uh, E and F, which is about the area, fundamental theory of calculus, which I haven't taught you why. Okay, I've just taught you how so far. That's the last exercise of this chapter. But that summarizes what you need to do, so yeah? Okay, the next few exercises after, hey, take is just uh, miscellaneous, just to practice all those skills again, and I'm just going to go through a few with you so that you kind of go, oh yeah, I remember how I did that. But then I, J are the only two extra skills you need. Area between curves, okay, now you know how to find area under a curve, what about between two curves, okay? And the other one is average value, always comes up in the exam multiple choice, okay? And that's it. That's chapter 11, then we whip through to chapter 7, I'm going to focus mainly on two exercises, and, and then we'll start revising week three, because I think you're sex in week four. Okay? But that's, that's the goal. Alright? Here we go. Let's practice some examples here. That's not difficult, because we can separate the integration here. We can say you can integrate this separately. Integration of e to the 2x using your rule from 11d. What was the rule again? How do I integrate e to the 2x? Yes, Luke? Good, it will be 1 on 2, e to the power of 2x, good. How do I integrate 4 over x? Just because it's a fraction is not scary. How do you do integration of 4 over x, Naz? Say it again. Yep, just tell me the answer. Yep, that's correct. 4 log e of x because... See this, if you rewrite this, this is the same thing saying 4 times x to the power of negative 1. Now remember, the rule that I gave to you, and this is what I'm saying, the integration of ax plus b to the power of r, where r is equal to negative 1, which we do, we have a power of negative 1, we know the integration has to be a log. In our case, a is 1, b is 0. That's what we have there, x. x is just a is 1 and b is 0. Okay, so if I just put a bracket around it, maybe it looks a bit more familiar and take the 4 out. So that's why we know that this will end up being 1 over a, which is 1. Okay, so 1 over 1. And ax plus b, which is just x, 
to the power of, oh, sorry, log e of x, sorry, log e of x, mod of x. And because we've got the 4 on the outside, we're going to times this by 4, and that's plus c. There you go. That's why if I rewrite all of this, this now becomes plus 4 log e mod of x. Don't need to do plus c because you've got definite integrals. They'll cancel out the c's anyway. You've got from 1 to 2. Now using 11e, using 11e, once we enter antiderivative of each one of these two, get it separated by a plus and a minus sign, and you derive them, now I need to use fundamental theorem and calculus, 11e. How do I do this again? What was the rule? So I found f, this is your capital F. What was the rule again? What do you do? Good. Sub 2 in, the upper interval minus sub the lower interval. Okay, so all you're doing here is you're just saying sub 2 into f of x and subtract f of 1. Okay, so you can do that by hand or you can do it on a CAS. But here we go, we've got half e to the 2 times 2 plus 4 log e of mod of 2. Okay, that's one bracket minus half times e to the power of 2 times 1 plus 4 times log e of 1. Now using your rules, what's log e of 1? Zero. Okay, you have to remember log e is just asking e to the power of what? That's just saying e to the power of what will give you 1. And we know that e to the power of 0 will give you 1. So this is 0. Okay. And so you rewrite the whole entire equation. That's half e to the 4 plus 4 log e of 2 uh, minus half e squared. Okay. And you can factorize that or whatnot, but that that's just a simultaneous, oh sorry, it's a um, miscellaneous question. That was question one, and I picked out E because I wanted to carry on that idea. Fractions. Okay. The first one is the part is the second part of the fraction. Yeah. Okay, but you can see I'm just using all these skills that we've just learned from 11A to 11G, just combining them together. Okay. Let's try the next one. I want you to have a look at the next one. Same idea. Now put a circular function in. So that's 11g there. Using the rules, 11g, let's split them up individually. Let's work this one out. Integration or antiderivative of sine of x on 4. So let's do this individually. What's the rule again? Antiderivative of sine of x on 4 becomes what now? Can I please have? Let's go with Shelley. Antiderivative of sine of x on 4. <laughs> yep. Negative. 1 over, one over 4. Good. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Good. And 1 over 1 quarter. It's equal to what? How do we simplify that? We never leave our fractions with fractions on fraction. Four. Okay, how many quarters in one? There's four of these quarters in one. So we can rewrite that as four. Okay, so negative four cos of x on four. And now plus antiderivative cos of x on four. This one would be jack. Not four cos. For sine x on 4. Okay? So you can see that's just 11g. I'm just anti deriving, and then now I'm using 11e to find the definite integral. So same, same skills over and over. Yeah? So this is 0 to pi, but obviously you need to know your exact values to do 0 to pi. Sub in pi, sub in 0. Okay? Same skills. What about the last one? How do we do this one? So I'm just trying to find things that you might have forgotten how to do. How do you do this one? So you've got the last one, you've got antiderivative. Now we know it's 1 to 4, we know how to do that. We just need to know how do I antiderive when I have this issue here. What's the issue? You have to recognize the issue to then fix the issue. Yeah? What's the issue? What's the problem? What's the problem with the last one compared to every other one I've chosen? Someone tell me, what is the issue? What is the problem? Why can't I just antiderive 2 and antiderive 1 and x? Why can't I just do what I did here? Yeah. 
some wood. Goes on. Uh, the whole thing squared. The whole thing squared. That's a problem because we have not learned to rule to deal with anything where you have, you, you've learned to rule where if it was ax plus b to the power 2, you've learned that if it was linear. But that's not linear in here. So you haven't learned to change the rule where it's not linear. So the only way to do it, because you've only learned power rule, you've learned chain rule only if this was linear, ax plus b. You've learned log exponential, which is none of that, and you've learned sine and cosine, which is none of that either. Okay? So the only way to do this at this moment has to be depth expanded. And that's one of the tips. Anytime you get those brackets, the only way to do it is using power rule. Get them into their individual terms. C2 you can do, that's x to power zero. This is x to power negative one. So if you expand it, it's possible to do. Okay? So now expanding, that goes back to chapter four. Chapter four, expanding two plus one over x squared. What does that give me? That's a perfect square. How do you expand perfect squares again? Let's go with Rachel. How do I expand this? Not sure? Let's go with the rule again. If I gave you a plus b squared, the rule is square the first one, a squared plus two times a b plus b squared. That's your rule for uh, expanding a perfect square with its to the power of two. And you've got two terms, a plus b. So in our case here, it's two plus one over x. Same idea. So let's do it using the rule a squared. So I'm doing two squared plus b or two times a times b. So two times a times b plus b squared, which is one of x squared, yeah? Same rule as what you've been doing since year 9, 10, and 11, yeah? So it's still ax squared or a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. That's the same thing. I haven't done anything to that, okay? a happens to be 2, b happens to be 1 and x. And I'm just following the rule. 2 squared plus 2 times a times b, okay, plus b squared. Squared. Simplify that down, that now becomes 4 plus 4 over x plus 1 over x squared. To make it easier for yourself, this is the same thing saying 4 plus 4 times x to the power of negative 1 plus x to the power of negative 2. Okay? So all I've done is I've just expanded this bracket and now I've got this. This is much easier to do. And now if I ask you to find the antiderivative of each one, it's possible to do. Antiderive 4, antiderive x negative 1, you know that. That's the ax, AX to the power of n rule, except for this one. Okay? None of it is equal to negative 1 except for that one. This is your log rule. Okay? Negative 1 is your log rule. That's 1 is not negative 1. Now you can antiderive it. Once you're going to antiderive it, definite integral. How's that feel? Cool? Okay, I'm going to leave you guys there. That's 11H. That's just to revise all the skills you've learned from 11A to 11G. And I was just trying to recap to you what you're really doing in Chapter 11. There aren't many skills to it. It's everything is reverse of derivative. The better your derivatives, the better your antiderivatives. Okay. All right, I'll leave you guys there. That's 11H. Just work through 11H now. Just for those who have done or feel a bit proficient with these, the questions I do want you to look at it's question four. These tend to come up in the exam. It's a typical one where it's like three to four marks, um, where they will say, find the derivative of something like this, at x log u of 2x. It's always a product rule of some sort, or a quotient rule of some sort. And then they say, find the antiderivative of this. Okay? That generally gets a bit tricky. Those are like the one page in your exam one, and they're worth doing. They tend to come up like, not every year, but it's consistent enough to check something like that. That's the practice. Okay, so question four, and if you like as well, question eight, just in case you forgot how to change 2x plus 3 divided by x minus 1 for that. Out of curiosity, anyone remember how to do that? How do I show this equals this? So one technique. Form division, chapter four. Okay, that's from last year, cubic division or long division. Literally do 2x plus 3 divided by x minus 1, and you'll get that. Yeah, that's generally something most students kind of freak out because they see fractions, but really all you're doing is just saying 2x plus 3, how many x minus 1s fit into that. Do it, so 2 times the x will give you 2x, 2 times negative 1 is minus 2. Do the long division, 0, 3 minus negative 2 gives you 5, 
So now you can say it goes in two holes, remainder of five, so remainder of five over what you were dividing by. That's how you get that. Okay? So I'm just doing long division. I'm just doing long division. Two holes, remainder of five, that's my remainder out of what you were dividing by. That's how you show that. But that is 11H. And then once you guys get back into your momentum, uh, tomorrow, I mean Wednesday, I'll jump right in and do IJ, then we do K, and finish it off this week. Any questions? And we're good. We're back on track again. Thursday, Thursday, and then, and then the Monday after. Oh, I gotta stop the video. I'll be on a snow trip. <laughs> so exciting. Relax.